you know, the benefits of diverse teams, I think you know, that there's loads of data out there. Um, I, I don't like talking about the business case because that makes it sound like you're just doing it for the money. But this idea that diverse teams are more effective, that's that's well researched and well supported. But what people often talk about is that it can go wrong. You know, diverse teams that aren't inclusive are actually less effective than homogenous teams, right? So diversity isn't, isn't an unalloyed good. Hi everyone, welcome back to the All Inclusive Podcast. On today's episode, I'm joined by Robert Andrews, Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer at Mubern Ellis LLP, one of Europe's top intellectual property firms. During the episode, we delve into the topic of engaging with key stakeholders to promote DEI and gaining their support and buy-in for DEI initiatives. Robert shared his insights on how to address pushback and keep moving forward with DEI initiatives. And we also discussed the strategies and approaches Robert's found to be effective in fostering a more inclusive and equitable environment. As always, before jumping into the video, make sure to hit that subscribe button, turn on your notification bell and follow on your favourite podcast platform so that you never miss an episode. That being said, let's jump in. Hi, Robert. Hi, Sasha. Hello. Oh, I'm so excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. So let's kick things off. Tell our listeners a little bit more about you and your journey to where you are today as a DEI leader. Who? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so who am I? Uh, I'm. A, so I work for a, a law firm in the city of London called Mubin Ellis. We deal with with intellectual property, IP patents, um, and I'm their chief inclusion and diversity officer. Um, my background isn't isn't as an ID professional actually. So I'm a, I'm a scientist by training. Um, did a did science university, then a PhD. Um, became an attorney and worked as an attorney for a long time. Um, and, and then I guess the short the short route into DNI leadership is that um, our firm created a role of chief inclusion and diversity officer. Um, probably towards the end of 2021, I think it was now. Um, in in recognition of the fact that our sort of growing DNI strategy needed a leader, needed some responsibility, uh, needed a voice at the management table, and I put myself forward for that role. Um, and here I am. Um, I suppose the longer story, at least for me personally, is sort of how I got to the point where I felt ready to put myself forward for the role. Um, but I think maybe that's a bit beyond that first question. <laughs> well, actually, it then goes into my second question. <laughs> so quite smoothly, is how has your personal experiences and um, your identity really shaped um, how you kind of go about promoting DEI in your organisation? Yeah, it, it, that, that's a good question. I mean, um, I've always been a quite private person, actually. I kind of keep myself to myself. Um, uh, and I think maybe that came from from like my background. So um, I grew up in, in West Cornwall, um, quite rural background, um, quite poor, I think, actually, as well. Um, and I was a bit of an outsider at school, um, quite overweight. I was a bit like one of the, the nerdy kids as well. So it's kind of a, a little bit of an outsider at school. Um, then when I went to university, um, also a little bit of an outsider, I think, um, coming from the background I came from. Um, I went to quite a, a well-to-do university and I just felt completely not at home. And it's quite a difficult time in my life, actually, um, just get, get to grips with that. And I think um, I think then even after you do, once I sort of felt like I caught up in some respects, um, I, I still felt like I didn't fit in. Um, I spent the next 10 years trying to work out what it was about me. Um, and in the end, I sort of discovered that I'm quite queer in, in many different ways. And it's kind of like that's been the underlying sort of difference, I think, that's just kind of driven me through school, through university to where I am today. Um, but yeah, I, I think having having made peace with that and sort of really who I am, I sort of kind of just, just kept it to myself in my personal life um, and got on with it because I always thought that who I was would at best the usual thing at work and, and at worst could probably play against me kind of worry about that and you have this maybe self-doubt that um that other people will will ridicule you or somehow ostracize you for being for being different from the rest so i kept myself to myself it got to 2019 that i'd worked myself to quite a senior position in the firm i was in but i still very much kind of kept my personal life and my my personal identity i suppose separate from from work because i'd always I'd always doubted that it would be 
Yes, it'd be accepted, but I, I, I thought at best it'd be neutral and where it possibly a disadvantage. Um, you know, maybe may my my partners or business colleagues might think that it may be a, a less a less good attorney in the business. But then, you know, around that time, there are lots of lots of important things happening in my life. Um, so my wife was pregnant with with my daughter, um, who was born in in January 2020, and then just just under a month later, three weeks later, my my older sister died unexpectedly, which was which is a big shock to me and and, and my parents. And then, you know, a month after that, 2020, the pandemic came, lockdown happened, and we're all sent home. So a huge, huge change in sort of living and working conditions for everybody. But, but all those things happening together sort of made me reflect, I suppose, on, on who I was, where I was, um, and what I wanted for the future, you know, how I related to, to the people I work with, to my parents, um, what I wanted for my daughter as well. Um, and and it, it, it just I just realized or I just came to the realization that um, it wasn't enough to just be myself to myself and be be, be private and personal anymore because you know, I, I was in a senior position in the firm and and there were people could be people who who were like me but 10 years further down the track or younger who, who I could help I suppose I could sort of be a role model for and that I could help help change things for the better. So that that kind of crystallized in my mind. And about the time the, the firm started making more noises or, or looking like they were going to take I and D more seriously. And so this role came up and they said, you know, does anyone does anyone want to do this? Can anyone do this? And it just felt like the right opportunity at the right time. Because you know, I looked around and I thought, I can I can do this job. Um, I really think I'm I'm ready to to take it on and and, and kind of take responsibility for for spreading IE within our firm and, and hopefully wider. So so yeah, it's quite a long story, I suppose, but um that that's kind of how I, how I got to where I am today. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, Robert. Um, I think it's it's a really interesting story, and I'm really sorry to hear about the passing of your sister. Um, but I can completely understand how those sorts of moments has has really propelled you to to where you are today um and I'm so glad that you have taken that the courage to step out of 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 your box to step out of yourself um and try and help others um I think it, it it's amazing to hear so for you I mean it it was must have been a really big big change um and it's a change in role and it's it's probably a a position where you're revealing a little bit more about yourself which you wouldn't usually do um so how was that how did you how did you feel about telling your your colleagues or, or your employers a little bit more about yourself um it, it was easier than I, than I expected actually um I think you're used to hiding stuff about yourself or you, you, you build you build up ideas in your mind of how people will react to the, the real you. Um, so, and I have to say, everybody where it was really cool. They just saw like, oh, look, there's Rob. <laughs> he, he's now the chief of ND. And look, he looks like chief of ND as well. Um, but yeah, they, they were really cool. Um, but I, I still find it quite hard, I think, putting myself into the spotlight something funny i think to say speaking to you on a podcast that's going to be watched by, by who knows how many people but um you know I, I find myself now in this sort of situation quite regularly you know i had a had a photo shoot for the company magazine and um people want to talk to me about ind and um yeah i think every time it's still a little bit like do i do i really want to do this you know i'm I, it's not a happy place for me i think in front of an audience so i kind of i find myself there quite often these days Oh well, um, I mean, you're doing great. <laughs> I'm so glad that you've been, <laughs> you've you've taken the leap to come on the podcast. That's amazing. Um, so intellectual property. I mean, it's a very niche area. However, it is an integral part in a lot of industries and a lot of, through a lot of um, different areas of of business. Um, so how do you effectively engage key stakeholders in the work that you're doing and getting their buy in? Yeah, I mean. I think it's probably a challenge that everyone everyone who tries to lead on, on D and I gets right. It's, it's any population of people you 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 care to pick, be it 
and I, intellectual property firm or, or any other industry, you know, there's a range of people all the way from the cheerleaders who, who probably don't need any advice or help from you right to the people who don't really see the point of DNI or, or think maybe it's it's something that should be kept away from work. Um, so how do, how do I engage these people? I think the key thing is is like DNI is about people. It's it's really personal. Um, it's not really about policy, and and a lot of people get turned off by policy. You know, you start talking about recruitment policies or fair treatment policies or parental leave policies. I mean, I mean that they are important and they're they're part of the mechanics. But I think it's wrong to lead out with them. I think you kind of you lose people. So so I found it really effective in our organisation to to start with people. Um, stories, people talking about their own experiences, what's important to them, how DNI themes have touched their lives, and, and and I think that really draws people into DNI as a as a as an area. And then once you've got them on board, it, it's so much easier to sort of actually then go and change the nuts and bolts of the policy to to make things better. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge advocate for storytelling. Um, I think it's it's. It's a quick way to get to to the heart of of the issues and to get to the heart of people, um, and I, lo I love that that approach, and I'm glad it's one that you're taking also. Um, but how do you address any pushback? Because we know that I mean it's not not all blame sailing, so <laughs> there will always be um, those that that don't quite agree. So what do you find has been quite an effective tool aside from kind of te you telling your story or, or others telling theirs? <sighs> Again, it's, 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 it sounds simplistic, doesn't it? But 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 talking to people, like really, really listening to and engaging with people, um, but people are rarely malicious, uh, in my experience. You know, even people who vehemently disagree with you or, or hold views that you you might think are you know borderline offensive. You know, um, quite often people have their reasons. Um, We're going to take a minute to thank our friends at Dandy the DEI analytics company for supporting the show. To drive real change today, DEI leaders need to be strategic and they need to be data-driven. That's why today's most successful DEI leaders use Dandy to measure and manage their DEI programs in real time, track key DEI metrics and create reports at a push of a button. Are you ready to join the DEI measurement movement? Click the link in the description below to download your free essential guide to data-driven DEI transformation. So I, I try to assume good intent and I try to talk to people and and, and listen to what they've got to say, uh, essentially, and then and try to present my idea or my point of view in, in a different way. Um, and experience is, my experience at least, is that quite often you've got to present the same idea in a couple of different ways um, with a couple of different reasons for doing it before you really kind of get a critical mass of people behind it. Um, but, but that's OK. I, I, I think I think the danger is that of getting frustrated because um, that, that's almost the bigger challenge for me is that you know, alongside the cohort of people that are pushing back, there's also a cohort of people who are really keen and they can get disappointed and frustrated if, if they feel that progress isn't fast enough. And, and sort of someone like me who's supposed to be you know, leading it all, it's kind of keeping both of those those people on side is, is really challenging. Um, I, I think the most challenging thing, in fact. Mm, I mean, it's it's managing that expectation for people because it's one thing that everyone wants, or not everyone, but majority of people that, that you've come across and, and, and through what I've been doing as well is that a majority of people want to there to be a change and they want to create these inclusive environments. Um, and so they're all for it, but they, ex some people or quite a few just expect it all to happen overnight <laughs> or within a few months <laughs> or within a year. Um, and I think it's definitely, it's more of a marathon perspective rather than a sprint. Do you know what I mean? And so, um, I completely understand where you're coming from in terms of managing the two in, in, in terms of making sure that everyone's on board to, to create this change, but they understand that it's not going to be plain sailing and there may be some setbacks or there may be some things that we put in place now that we're not going to see any sort of progress on for another two, three years. Um, but it, it, it's something that you need to kind of explain is that it will happen. 
we're just on this journey all together and as long as we're all pitching in yeah. and we're going in the right direction we will get there do you know what i mean yeah i i, I do and I, I, I think there's a lot of managing expectations as, as well i mean i think within within organizations I, th I think particularly businesses where you know you sort of you have to you have to make money and not in a sort of a crude capitalist sense oh, but yeah right, no it's true you, yeah we, we've got 400 people here right and they've that's you know that's however many mortgages it is to pay so the business has to be a going concern otherwise change is meaningless right we'll just go bust so mm -hmm. so like trying to achieve kind of cultural change and, and social change context of uh you know a, a functioning business it, that's something that i think uh, a lot of people don't don't understand at first and, and not because Uxta hadn't had to think about it basically um and that and that's challenging it's sort of trying to get people with what say the more of an activist mindset see that you know this is you're not going to get everything you want basically it, this is you know it's going to be messy it's going to be slow there's going to be a lot of compromise but if you want the change to stick this is this is how you have to do it um yeah you know and, and that's Again, that, 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 that's tricky for some people to accept. Mm. So what do you think DEI leaders don't talk enough about when it comes to DEI, but they really should be talking more on? Um, I think the costs of DNI actually, you know, the, the downsides. I mean, a, a lot of DEI you know, leaders are kind of evangelical about it. And, and I think you have to be, and, and, and I am in my way, uh, because I think if you weren't, you'd, you'd just stop because it's really hard. And, but you know, the benefits of diverse teams, I think you know, there's loads of data out there. Um, I, I don't like talking about the business case because that makes it sound like you're just doing it for the money. But this idea that diverse teams are more effective, that's, that's well researched and well supported. But what people don't often talk about is that it can go wrong. You know, diverse teams that aren't inclusive are actually less effective than homogenous teams, right? So mm -hmm. diversity isn't, isn't an unalloyed good. Uh, so you can, might go through a stage where your business functions less well. Um, and even if you don't, the amount of time and effort that your leaders are going to have to put in to learn inclusive leadership skills, that's going to be a big cost. I mean, you, you, might, you might benefit, hopefully you will benefit more in the medium to long term, but it's going to be hard and you're going to have to suck up some short term pain. And I, and I think as leaders, D &I leaders, if we're not honest about that, then as soon as those negative effects are felt by, by people who aren't fully engaged, then they're going to feel cheated um, or, or indeed surprised, and that's going to going to split the consensus that you need basically to deliver the change. So, I think you've got to be be pretty blunt about it's not going to be an easy journey, but it's going to be a necessary journey and one that's going to be worth it in the long run. But you've mm. got to be in it for the long run too. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. So I love hearing about new initiatives and programs that leaders have been put in place so could you share with us a, a successful program or initiative that, that you've run <laughs> yeah i mean i, I don't know no, I, I don't think i'm going to tell you about, about new initiatives because because quite you know there's there's a book out which which is quite quite well established and, and i've stolen a few pages from it that, that have worked quite well so stories i mean we found that communities or like employee resource groups or, or whatever you want to call it have actually been really effective. You know, what I mean by the idea is sort of um, getting groups of people who, who are kind of congregating around a shared theme um, and getting them to take responsibility for um, kind of leading discussions, managing sort of topics to do with that, that area within the firm, um, doing external facing. So, so I'll give you an example. So we've got a um, one of the first groups that was set up was a was a menopause group actually, um, to, uh, dealing with issues of menopause, um, and that's been hugely hugely influential in the firm. They've uh, they've run um, education courses, there's discussion groups, uh, courses for the whole firm. So it's not not just limited to the, to the group itself. Members of that group have been out talking in industry industry wide bodies, kind of contributing to uh, progressing that topic like across the IP industry. And, you know, they've only really been established for 18 months and what they've done in that time is has been phenomenal um so so yeah i mean th th that that's one of the schemes that, that that's been most successful for us because because of the way it kind of devolves leadership and responsibility away from management into the people that's actually affected and that that's that's really effective oh 
Oh, lovely. And so is there anything looking back that you would have done differently in, in setting that group up or, or just in setting up any other employee resource groups? Well, I think we would have done differently. Um, I, I would have been, I would have been more ready for it to take a long time um, because it, ha it has taken a long time to set up. Um, part of that was because we we waited for leaders to emerge um, in in those groups. We you know it, we decided that it wouldn't work to try to set those groups up from from like top down. Just kind of expect people to turn up. So we kind of waited for people to come forward who were interested in the topics and had the sort of the energy and the, and the vision to set them up. Um, that took a long time, um, and uh, and it and it kind of I think as a leader you want things to happen quickly because you're enthusiastic and you sort of you feel like you're being measured and that kind of led to me being a little bit impatient I think um, so so I think the thing I would change is to have more patience um, and, and and believe things are going to happen because they do eventually. Oh lovely and looking to the future um, what changes or improvements do you hope to see in DEI? DEI is that in is a whole thing or in 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 my sector in particular? I mean, I would go with both actually. Why not give us a perspective on both? What what uh, would you? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I I think I think conveniently the answer the answer is probably similar for for both DEI DEI as a whole and and my sector. I think better coordination is what I'm, I'd like in the future. I think. Um, but my experience here is that cultural change is really hard and it's really slow, even with the, even with the best of intentions. Um, and and I think what contributes to it being slow is you know there's lots of isolated bodies trying to solve the same problems again and again and again. Um, but I think I think if like-minded or bodies or people facing similar problems can can get together and share knowledge, share ideas, it's it's a really great way to accelerate change and sort of help spread best practice so I mean that in mind I mean for example in the IP industry there there is a um, industry-wide body called IP inclusive that's run um, well the the, the chair of a fantastically uh, dynamic and motivated woman called Andrea Brewster and she's she's doing a fantastic job but um, I think for IP sector I think firm like like us Muben Ellis really engaging with IP inclusive and, and really kind of getting on board with that and, and exchanging knowledge and best practice would be a really good way to accelerate DEI across our sector at least. Oh yeah that sounds amazing I think it's I mean that's for me was one of the reasons why I started the podcast um, in all honesty is to create a platform where we could share knowledge where leaders like yourself are able to to share stories troubleshoot best practice um, because I think what's the saying a problem shared is a problem taft and I think I've said this before on another podcast but it's so true <laughs> um, and yeah and it's great that there is something within the IP industry like IP inclusive where other other organizations other firms like yourself can can join and can be a part of of this huge change um, which is going to benefit everyone yeah, and you know there there are some some issues that can only really be dealt with effectively at like a an industry wide level. I mean, like the IP industry, um, like diversity of recruitment is 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 a big big issue, right? I mean, because we get graduate applicants, and you know we we can try to be as fair and equitable as we can to the people who like who knock on our door, and we can try to broaden broaden the net. Fundamentally, you like you look at the um, you know the graduates from STEM subjects across universities in the UK, and th they're really lopsided. You know, you like you look at engineering, and it's like eighty percent male, for example. Um, so how do you how do you reach into the those pools and enrich them for diversity? Well, that, that's like a huge job, and it's something that you know an individual firm like us couldn't possibly hope to really make a dent in. You know, you really got to work at it at an industry wide, if not nationwide level. So yeah, coordination is is really key. Mm. Oh, I've so much enjoyed our conversation, Robert. Thanks again so much for, for joining me today. Um, just before you leave us, could you give one parting piece of advice for other leaders out there? So existing leaders or people are thinking of taking them out? Um, I mean, <laughs> existing leaders, I'd say, keep at it. You know, if like you're fighting a good fight and um, don't get frustrated, be patient. Um, and for, I think people are thinking about leadership I'd say go for it you know like if you're thinking about it then it probably means you're already in a good position so we we need you essentially so so don't hold back 
throw your throw your gauntlet into the ring. Oh, lovely. That, that's such great advice, Robert. Um, how, if for anyone who is listening, if they want to connect with you, how best can they do that? Um, well, as I, as I said, I kind of, unfortunately, I find myself all over the video these days, at least in IP circles. But um, if you go onto our website, um, Uben Ellis, there's, there's my blog there, um, my bio, you can just reach me, my email address is there. Um, and, and I'm also, if you put in Robert Andrews patent, you'll probably spit me out of Google and you can, you can email me. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. Well, I will be putting a link down below to Move and Ellis. So um, anyone who <laughs> is listening can reach out to you in that way as well. Um, but thanks again, Robert. Hey, thank you, Natasha. It's been great.